Oh, just having said that, someone is entering. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to uh, welcome our third speaker for the morning, Amanda Young, uh, who will speak on gap stability of topologically ordered ground states in the infinite volume setting. Please. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, the work I'm going to be talking to you about is an ongoing saga with Bruno Nakshigali and Robert Sims. And um, the idea is kind of related to these, these gaps uh, phases of matter. And as we've talked about throughout the, the series of this, this workshop, um, two quantum spin models or two quantum models are considered to be in the same phase. If you can smoothly connect the Hamiltonians in a way that the gap remains open along the path. And the, the question I'm going to consider today is, is somewhat related to this. Uh, it's really, we're going to talk about the stability of the gap. And so the idea is going to be we're, we're given some model for which we know the model is, is gapped. And we want to ask the question, if we add a small, but for the most part, arbitrary perturbation to the model, does the gap remain open in the presence of this perturbation? So is the new model that, I, that we create also gapped? And the, the technique that I'm going to focus on today was a stability strategy that was first introduced by Bobby Hastings and Michalakis in 2010, uh, in which they were able to prove uh, ground, uh, spectral gap stability for frustration-free quantum spin models uh, whose ground states satisfy a topological quantum order condition. So uh, also that's been kind of focused on in this talk is, is this idea of working in, in the GNS construction and in the infinite volume setting. So the, the new results that I have with Bruno and Bob uh, prove spectral gap stability in this GNS context. But the original Bravi hastings michalakis strategy was actually for uh, considering uniform uh, estimates for, for spectral gaps on finite volume systems. So I'm gonna, in the talk, talk about both kind of concepts. So first we're gonna be discussing uh, gap stability in the finite volume setting, and then in the second half, move to these results that are in the GNS construction. So to begin with, uh, I'm gonna be working in the, the setup of a quantum spin model. And just for simplicity in this talk, I'm gonna restrict our attention to the, the integer lattice uh, arbitrary dimension D. And I'm also gonna restrict to interactions that are supported on the balls of our lattice. So I'm going to impose some, some nice metric on our space, say the L infinity metric. Uh, that doesn't particularly matter. And these results do hold more generally, but this just makes some of the statements easier to make. All right, so for every site in the lattice, we're going to associate to a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And so this also comes along with the algebra of observables that acts on that Hilbert space. And as I said before, we're going to first consider this, this Robbie hazes michalakis strategy in the finite volume setting. And in this case, when you take any finite volume subset of your integer lattice, you denote for this uh, lattice, excuse me, for this volume, the set of uh, the Hilbert space of states given by the tensor product of all of the finite dimensional Hilbert spaces associated with each site contained in lambda. And similarly for the algebra. So with this, this construction of, of Hilbert space and algebras, we can now define um, an interaction uh, for, to define a, a quantum spin model. And so for each ball in our, our lattice, we're going to associate to it a self-adjoint operator that's uh, supported on the algebra uh, associated with that ball. And then with, with this, uh, definition of once we fix an interaction, we can define the local Hamiltonians by taking the sum over all of the interaction terms whose support is contained in the volume lambda. And here, of course, when I write a summation of this form, I'm, I have to somehow identify this observable, uh, the support on the ball uh, radius in around x with the full finite volume lambda. And how we do this is by tensoring with the identity on all sites outside of the ball. All right, so again, because we've chosen our on-site Hilbert spaces to be finite dimensional and the volume lambda is also a finite subset of lattices, 
the, this Hamiltonian is acting on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And so the set of possible energy values, uh, which is just the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, is just given by its eigenvalues, the distinct eigenvalues. And even though we're going to allow for, for a degeneracy in our ground state, um, we, we label specifically the distinct eigenvalues. And when we're talking about gaps, we, we wanna talk about the difference between these two different eigenvalues. Uh, now, of course, I'm not interested necessarily in a single finite volume subsystem. I'm interested in thinking about the thermodynamic limit of these systems. So in this context, we're gonna be thinking about what happens to the spectrum of this Hamiltonian as we let the, the volume lambda tend to the entire lattice. And as we kind of think about it, we have this kind of construction here of these, these kind of four different objects, including the Hamiltonian, as well as I should have mentioned earlier, um, the Heisenberg dynamics. And um, in particular, if we're thinking about taking this, this thermodynamic limit, as we've discussed kind of already throughout the week, the things that can converge are the algebra of observables. We can naturally define an infinite volume algebra of observables. And in situations where the interaction uh, is sufficiently short range, you can also show that the dynamics converges. However, the Hamiltonian and the Hilbert space will not. And this is why we often will use the GNS construction. But, but now let's turn our attentions to the gap. So for any, any fixed finite volume Hamiltonian, the gap above the ground state is just given by the difference of the first excited energy and the ground state energy. Now, as we said, this is, this is a finite, it's a matrix, so it's acting on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So we know this gap is positive for any fixed finite volume Hamiltonian. When you wanna say that your system is gapped though, what you wanna do is, is prove a uniform result. So the idea is that you wanna find some sequence of increasing and absorbing finite volumes lambda n. And then you wanna look at the gap associated with each of those Hamiltonians along the sequence. And the question you wanna ask is whether or not this, these gaps can be uniformly bounded from below by a positive constant that's independent of the system size. So if you can prove that the infimum of these gaps is strictly positive, then you would say that the system belongs to a gapped phase. Now, one, yes. one observation. So how about, uh, do we require the spectrum to be bounded from below or we can let it flow all the way to minus infinity and we so, only get the gap? Right, so the, um, the individual finite volume Hamiltonians will always have a bounded spectrum. So in, in that sense, I, don't, I, I would oftentimes even just subtract the, the ground state energy to make it zero. And so I don't, I don't care if the, the spectrum goes to, to negative infinity. You could actually show that the GNS Hamiltonian uh, will have ground state energy zero regardless of the finite volume ground state energies. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so this is how you would con kind of contextualize uh, the finite volume gap, uh, a, a uniform gap in the finite volume system. Now, uh, one thing I wanna point out because it will come up later uh, there's a there's a qualifier here of if there exists such a sequence. So it is absolutely possible that you could, for example, change the geometry of your volumes and unintentionally introduce edge states that could close the gap. So it's the existence of a sequence for which this holds that you want to prove the gap. All right, so this is the, the finite volume context. So let's talk a, a bit about the, the infinite volume system for a minute. Um, just to kind of compare and contrast. So as we've seen already that um, using this in this uh, inclusion of finite volume systems within one another, you can inductively define a, the union of these algebras to get the algebra of local observables. And then upon taking the, the norm closure of the set, you construct a C star algebra of quasi-local observables that's associated with the infinite lattice CD. And so this is going to be the C star algebra that we use for defining our, our, our ground states in the thermodynamic limit setting. And in particular, the, the states that I'm going to consider on this algebra are the states 
that can be obtained as weak star limits of finite volume ground states. So the idea here is I, I'm gonna have some sort of tracial state on a finite volume system where the range of the density matrix uh, is contained in the ground state space of the associated Hamiltonian. So the ground state space being just the uh, eigenspace associated with the ground state energy. Now for, for interactions that decay sufficiently fast, which all of the, the types of Hamiltonians we'll consider today will satisfy this criterion. Uh, you can use the GNS construction then to construct a, a GNS Hamiltonian for any such weak star limit. And so when we're talking about the infinite system being gapped, uh, we're, um, we're talking about whether or not the GNS Hamiltonian is gapped. And so, as I said before, uh, this is a, a, a self-adjoint operator that's not negative. You can show its ground state energy is actually zero. And so uh, the spectral gap then is the gap of the Hamiltonian above zero. Does it mean this formula is it really in, infimum or supremum? Oh, sorry, that's a typo. Yes, thank you. That should be a zoom. Thank you. You know, you copy these slides a couple of times so you stop catching the typos. <laughs> All right. So, um, so now we have these, these two different concepts of gap. And so a natural question is how do we, these two definitions relate to one another? And uh, I think it's very intuitive to expect that whatever uniform, whatever uniform gap you, you obtain here, you would expect would be a lower bound for the GNS Hamiltonian gap. And in the situation that the interaction that you're using to define your Hamiltonians is finite range, and also it's called frustration free, you can actually show that this, this holds. So frustration freeness, and I'll, I'll give a concrete definition in a couple of slides, is this idea that the ground states of any finite volume Hamiltonian simultaneously minimize the energy of all the interaction terms. So they're, they're ground states of all the interactions. So for example, the torque code model is an example of this or the AKLT model. If you have these uh, examples, if you know these examples. Um, and in particular, in terms of being able to prove spectral gap results, the majority of the proofs out there for quantum spin models are for these frustration free models. Um, in fact, I would say all of them up to probably possibly some special cases that I am probably forgetting, but the, the methods out there for testing a gap are specifically uh, geared towards these frustration-free systems. All right, so now that we, we have this definition of gap, let's talk about gap stability. So in this first part of the talk, we're, we're discussing this uniform gap. And so we're gonna be using, our motivation is to, to prove a uniform estimate somewhat like we had in the first definition on the previous slide. So the idea is going to be that we have some quantum spin model for which we know that a uniform uh, spectral gap holds along some sequence of increasing and absorbing finite volumes lambda n. And then we're gonna take that Hamiltonian that we know is gapped and we're going to add to it uh, another quantum spin Hamiltonian uh, and we're gonna interpolate with some parameter S. So S is some real value, but what you should really think of S is say living between zero and one. So you're, you're kind of turning on this, this new perturbation to the Hamiltonian. And if you go to classical perturbation theory and you order the eigenvalues of this perturbed Hamiltonian, what we know is that they actually will constitute continuous functions in the parameter S. And so if we start with a Hamiltonian that has a uniform gap, we know because of the continuity of the eigenvalues, that gap is going to remain open for some range of the parameter S. For every, for every finite volume Hamiltonian, you'll be able to keep this gap open. The question is, if you can find some range of the parameter S for which this gap remains open, for all values or all, all terms along the sequence. 
Now, one thing I, I, let me back up a second, I forgot to say, if you have degeneracy in your ground state, when you add this perturbation to the Hamiltonian, what will often happen is this eigenvalue, this ground state degeneracy will split. So you'll get a bunch of low-lying energies that are, um, that are coming off the ground state energies. So when I'm talking about gap stability in this case, I need to allow for this, this uh, eigenvalue splitting. So the gap I'm going to be considering in this, this work is going to be a gap that's above this eigenvalue splitting. So it's above these blue, these blue regions coming out of the ground state space for the unperturbed system. All right, so we would say that the gap then is stable if, if you fix your favorite parameter between zero and the, the uniform gap. And as I said before, this, this range of values S for which uh, the gap remains open for each term in the sequence can be uniformly bounded from below by a positive value. So the gap remains open for all terms of the sequence for this range of S. And kind of a mantra you can take in terms of trying to prove these sorts of gap estimates for, for perturbations is the idea of proving a form bound. So the, the idea is if you can prove a form bound for your perturbation in terms of your original Hamiltonian, then you can prove that the gap will remain open in, in a certain context. So this, this result that I, I'm sitting here holds uh, not just in a finite, a finite dimensional Hilbert space setting, but also in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And we'll, we'll use it for both results, the original uniform uh, spectral gap stability and the GMS stability later on. And so here, if we have some Hamiltonian with a gap in the spectrum between two values A and B, if you take some perturbation whose domain contains the, the domain of the original Hamiltonian, and if you can find some constants epsilon and beta for which the expectation of V can be bounded from above uh, by an inequality of this form, then you can actually use this epsilon and beta to, to uh, kind of uh, manipulate this gap to, to a, a gap for the perturbed system. So we've taken H and added the perturbation V, and we know that this, this new interval is now not in the spectrum of the original Hamiltonian. So of course you should think of epsilon as being something rather small and um, beta here is between zero and one. And so how we're going to apply this to the uniform gap stability is that we're gonna wanna show that this epsilon and beta can be chosen independent of the system size. All right, so now let's talk about the actual conditions that we need for this Robbie Hastings Michalakis strategy. So as I said before, uh, that they prove stability for frustration-free models with a topological quantum order condition on the ground states. So both frustration-freeness and uh, LTQO, as, as I will call it, um, are both properties of the ground state space of the unperturbed system. And so frustration freeness is this idea that the ground states will simultaneously minimize the energy of all the interaction terms. So up to shifting the Hamiltonian by the ground state energy, how you can interpret this is as the, that all of the interaction terms are non-negative and that the ground state energy is actually zero, which would mean that the ground state space is given by the kernel of the Hamiltonian and in particular that the kernel of the Hamiltonian is the intersection of all of the interaction terms. All right, so the, the second thing that you need is a topological order condition. And the one that I am going to use in this talk was actually first um, introduced by Mikulakis and Zolok in 2013. And it captures the idea that local observables cannot be distinguished by the ground state uh, space as you let, as you think of the, the space growing. And so for any observable A that uh, is supported on the ball of radius K, uh, so, so, so we'll say this system has LTQO, if we fix it, any observable A supported on some arbitrary ball of radius K. And then what we'll do is we'll look at the, the projection of A 
into the ground state space on some larger ball. So N here should be taken as being larger than K. So we've kind of sandwiched A by some larger ground state projection. And what this, this norm is saying is that there's some constant that can depend on the observable A itself uh, for which this projection of A into the ground state space is essentially a, a multiple of the identity, right? So it's, it's essentially constant. So in this case, if there is degeneracy in your ground state space, it cannot be detected by A. Now I've, I've kind of left this omega A as being, there exists a constant, but if you think about this, this norm bound for a second and you kind of interpret it in a weak sense, if I were to take the expectation of A in, in some ground state that's support on the ball of radius N, since I want overall this, this norm bound to tend to zero as N goes to infinity, what that would mean is that the expectation would have to converge to this omega of A. But if you, if you also think about the fact that then you're taking the limit of a, of a ground state expectation, that's this kind of uh, ground state functional that we considered in the GNS representation uh, for constructing infinite volume ground states. What that would mean is that every ground state expectation would have to converge to the same infinite volume ground state. So there's, there's kind of two pieces of information that we can pull from this. Number one, this omega of A is not actually kind of arbitrary. It's the ground state expectation in the thermodynamic limit. And number two, this, this ground state expectation in the thermodynamic limit is a unique function, functional. So you there's only one weak star limit. Excuse me, I have a question. You understand, what yes. is this great spectral projection? Is so this is the this is the the this is the uh, projection onto the ground state space of the Hamiltonian. So it's an eigenspace projection. But what is uh, the subscript B X and so that's that's the so this is denoting the Hamiltonian that it's the ground state of. So here, so it would be like if I replace lambda with B X n. So it's the ground state space associated with with B X n. Um, okay, so this finite ball of radius n centered at x. Yeah. If that was your question, I'm just I'm getting confused. I, I in finite volume, is this the ground state protection for a finite volume system, or, or yes, what? yes, ah. onto the ball of radius n around x. So it's for Hamiltonian for a finite volume system. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's onto this the x n. Okay. Thank you. All right, and then for the stability result, um, what we're going to need and what we're going to require is this function that's dictating the, the LTQO satisfies a certain moment condition. And I'll tell you exactly what this mu needs to be on, on the next slide. Okay, so then the, the to kind of encapsulate what's required for this these results, uh, we're going to once again be considering perturbed Hamiltonians of the following form. And the assumptions we need on the two interactions that are defining these various quantum spin Hamiltonians are the following. So for the unperturbed system, we need the, the interaction is finite range, uniformly bounded, frustration free, and it has slow decay of gaps on the balls. So remember how I said that this uniform gap condition, you could sometimes choose geometries where the gap actually closes. So what we want to actually uh, guarantee is that the, the gaps along the Hamiltonians of the balls decays at worst polynomially. And uh, this polynomial decay is going to be uh, determined by a, a parameter Q. And then with this parameter Q, we can now give the LTQO condition, which we would want this new for this moment condition to be uh, three halves times the dimension of the lattice plus, plus Q. So as long as that condition is satisfied, we'll be able to get stability. All right, so that's the, the constraints for the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Now for the perturbation, the, the constraint is actually fairly mild. Uh, we're going to assume that it's a short range interaction and it has to, in particular, the individual interaction terms have to decay at worst like a uh, stretched exponential. Now just to kind of, uh, this, this condition might seem a little bit strange, but the reason why it's here is due to the fact that there is this, this result 
for quantum spin models uh, where you can actually kind of give a recipe for, for a form bound. And so this, this general form bound recipe says, suppose that you have some finite volume Hamiltonian uh, that's frustration free and has this slow gap decay condition. And say that you have some other Hamiltonian uh, that can, it's also supported on balls. And in particular, the interaction term supported on the ball of radius K is annihilated by the ground states of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So this, this G is the ground state projection uh, as it was in the previous slide. So it's the ground state projection onto this, uh, the ground state space of this Hamiltonian. And under this, this condition, you can show that the, that the Hamiltonian V lambda is form bounded by, by H lambda, the original guy. And you can give an explicit formula for the constant in the form bound. And this is where this, the strategy kind of comes into play now. If we're thinking about trying to do a uniform estimate, what we would like to be able to do is define a function f here, where instead of, of maxing over the sites in, in lambda, we, we soup or we max over, we soup over all sites in gamma or in ZD, and that this function that we define is actually uh, summable. And then if that's the case, then we can actually get a form bound constant that's independent of the volume lambda. All right, so, so here's the actual result. So we have these perturbed Hamiltonians and we're looking to prove a uniform gap that's above this eigenvalue splitting. And rather than prove the stability result for the original perturbed Hamiltonian, what we actually end up doing is we consider a, unitor a unitarily transformed version of the Hamiltonian and we prove stability for this model. And so the, the result essentially says that there's some unitary out there that you can transform the perturbed system in such a way that you return the original unperturbed system. You get some new perturbation here, but that's okay. And you add a constant, uh, but constants don't change the gap. So we don't care so much about the constant. And the idea is that for this, this new perturbation, you can actually prove a form bound by the original unperturbed Hamiltonian, where the constants in the form bound are uniform in the volume and linear in S, the perturbation parameter. And then once you get this result, you can give an explicit lower bound then for how long the gap remains open by some parameter uh, gamma. Now this, the CN that I have here, it, it looks mysterious, but essentially what the CN is, is the average of the eigenvalues that you get that split off the ground state at the specific value of S. So you should think of it as the average of, of these particular values. And if you were to allow for a little bit of, of volume dependence in this form bound, you could actually improve things in a sense and you can replace this epsilon with an epsilon n that tends to zero. And what epsilon n controls is how much splitting you have uh, over these eigenvalues. And so if the epsilon n tends to zero, what that indicates to you in the thermodynamic limit is that this eigenvalue splitting converges back to a ground state. So in the end, even though we have the splitting, in the thermodynamic limit, it's really just a ground state uh, that is being mapped. So I don't want to go into too many details about how, how this fraud behaves in the strategy works, but I, I want to kind of give you um, the, the broad stroke, stroke highlights of, of what we do. So what we actually choose for these unitaries is something very specific. It's the quasi adiabatic continuation it was introduced by Hastings and Wynn. And, and this particular quasi abatic uh, evolution is very nice for two particular reasons. Uh, so number one, it sort of preserves the ground state space. So what you can show is that if you took the spectral projection of the perturbed Hamiltonian 
that's associated with this region of the spectrum that corresponds to this brown state splitting. The quasi-abatic uh, evolution actually takes that spectral projection and it maps it back to the ground state space of the unperturbed model. So that's very nice because now what that means is that this Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian have a common eigenspace to a certain extent, at least at this, for this particular part of the spectrum. Now, once you fix a unitary and say you, you define this constant C to be this average of the eigenvalue splitting, then this, Hamilton, uh, the, this perturbation is, is explicitly defined because it's the difference of, of these two quantities together. So now what we'd like to do is be able to take this, this very concrete Hamiltonian and rewrite it in a way in which this form bound recipe holds. Well, the problem here is that we've taken something local to define this VN. What we've done is we've taken something local and we've smeared it with a unitary that takes the, these local operators and it spreads the support to the entire algebra for this finite volume system. But what saves us here is the fact that the uh, quasi-adiabatic continuation is quasi-local. So it's, it's kind of along the same lines of what we were talking about in the last talk. Uh, so it satisfies, in particular, a Lee Robinson bound. Excuse me, I should back up. It's actually the Heisenberg dynamics generated by some uh, S-dependent Hamiltonian. And, in, and this particular Heisenberg dynamics satisfies a Lee Robinson bound. And so what that means is that even though the quasi-adiabatic continuation will smear the, su the support of an observable, uh, you can well approximate it again by something that's strictly local. And how, how good this approximation in is, is dependent on the decay of the original perturbation. So then combining these two properties, we can do this very technical process of carefully decomposing this, this perturbation in a way in which we can prove a form bound uh, that's uniform in both epsilon and beta. That's, that's how the BHM strategy works. And even though the original result was for, um, the original result was for models actually that have a stronger condition than frustration freeness, they have this, uh, they were Hamiltonians where the interactions uh, were given by uh, uh, mutually commuting uh, orthogonal projections and satisfied a condition that was a little bit stronger than this LTQO, it was called TQO. Um, but this, this method has been shown to be rather robust and it can also be applied to lattice fermion models. Um, in, in one dimension, we have, there is a result by Bruno and uh, Alvin Moon uh, and it can also hold for free from young lattice models in kind of arbitrary dimension. And uh, Bob, Bruno, and I have been working uh, on a number of different generalizations. So first of all, um, it can hold for more general graphs and boundary conditions. The original mo uh, method was for periodic boundary conditions. We can also modify it to hold for models with discrete symmetry breaking. And as I said before, uh, also in these infinite volume settings. And we're also working on a, an additional lattice fermion result. So let me now turn to this uh, infinite volume setting and, and discuss a little bit of one of the results that we have in that setting. All right, so um, I, we've already, we heard Yoshiko talk about this a lot in her talk earlier today, so maybe I won't go as in depth in detail about it, but what we're considering once again, just to remind you, are our infinite volume states on this quasi-local algebra of observables that are weak star limits of finite volume ground states. And then what the GNS construction tells you is that for any sort of state of this form, or any sort of state really, uh, you can associate to it a Hilbert space, a star representation, and also a cyclic vector omega for which you can interpret this state as the expectation of an observable A in this state omega for all observables in this quasi-local algebra. 
And in the situation that your, your finite volume system satisfies only Robinson bound, uh, you can actually show the, the dynamics of the finite volume system converge to an infinite volume dynamics. And that if you look at the dynamics in the Caesar algebra representation, it can be implemented via unitary. And what you use here is the fact that the, the state is actually invariant under the dynamics. And so this, this uniqueness clause in the GNS construction coupled with Stone's theorem will actually give you that it's actually given by a Heisenberg dynamics generated by an unbounded Hamiltonian H omega. And this is the GNS Hamiltonian that we're gonna be uh, analyzing today. And moreover, you can actually say a little bit more. Uh, you know that the image of the local op uh, operators acting on this cyclic vector is actually dense in the domain of H omega, and that the cyclic vector is actually a ground state of the Hamiltonian. And so we would like to prove spectral gap stability for the GNS Hamiltonian using this Robbie Hastings Michalakis idea. And so the, the gap assumption, the assumptions you need for the stability are, are essentially the same as what we had from, from before. The unperturbed model is going to be finite range, uniformly bounded, frustration free, satisfy LTQO and a slow gap condition. And the perturbation will decay like a stretched exponential at worst. And one thing uh, we can actually show in this setting is that the LTQO and the frustration freeness can be combined to show that this weak star limit is unique. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Does and so there's actually two, uh, yes? Formulate, before, uh, we're working from infinite volume from the start. Um, uh, there's two different ways you can go about it. And so that's what the two different results will, will show. Because the notion of local topological quantum order assumes that you, you're approaching infinite volume just by- Yes. By Yes, no, it, the, the LTQO is still a finite volume constraint, but so is, um, for example, the frustration freeness. You okay. could also interpret it in, in the, the state itself, but um, yeah, in, in this case, you do have these conditions that are on the finite system. That's correct. Because it's kind of important um, not to impose uh, approach the infinite volume from finite volume approximations, because uh, if you say it seems like in quantum whole systems, you do not have a gap. Uh, yeah. So I am not putting an assumption on the gap of the Hamiltonians other than the fact that the slow decay to begin with. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so there, there are two kinds of results. So the first result is in a situation where you do have uh, this uniform finite volume gap on the unperturbed Hamiltonians. And in that case, you can prove a similar result to what we had uh, in, on the original slide in which you can actually lift the stability of the unperturbed Hamiltonians on the finite volume system to the GNS Hamiltonian itself. Um, so originally I was gonna to try to talk about both results, but I think I would prefer to just kind of highlight how we, we do this, this other result though, which is the bulk gap stability. So for the bulk gap stability, we're only going to require the, the gap of the GNS Hamiltonian is positive. So we're not gonna make any assumptions on the, the, the gaps being open for the finite volume systems. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna prove stability for finite volume perturbations of the GNS Hamiltonian. And this finite volume stability will be uniform again in the volume lambda that we're perturbing at. And so this, this uh, motivation comes from exactly what the, the previous comment was saying, um, or, or even kind of more generally, the, the motivation comes from this idea of topological insulators where you in these systems have edge states that can close the uniform gap, but you, you still think of the interior that the model is behaving like a gap system. So you would expect in the thermodynamic limit that the GNS Hamiltonian is gapped, even though the finite volume systems are not gapped. All right, so, so what is the setup for this, this bulk gap stability? So we have this omega naught that's the unique ground state of the unperturbed interaction H. And in particular, one thing you can show then is that the, the kernel for the setup is that the kernel of the GNS Hamiltonian is one dimensional. It's given by the cyclic vector. 
And then we're going to consider a perturbation of this uh, where we, we take the genus Hamiltonian and we add to it the image of some finite volume perturbation in the GNS representation. So it looks very similar to what we considered from before. And so under the assumptions of this, this GNS stability that we had on this previous slide, we can show that um, if we have a uniform gap gamma naught for the GNS Hamiltonian, then if we fix our favorite value of the parameter gamma between zero and the uniform gap, or the, the gap at the GNS Hamiltonian, that the, the gap of the perturbed system will stay open by this value of gamma um, for a parameter S gamma that's independent of the volume lambda, which we are perturbing at. So um, kind of just a side remark, once again, because of the, the, the setting that we have, we actually know that the, the gap will remain open for some value of the parameter and so what our result shows is that this, this parameter is actually uniform uh, in the, the finite volume perturbation that we choose. OK, so um, we're going to denote uh, the ground state energy of the perturbed system by this E lambda s. And similarly, it's eigenstate by gamma of lambda s. We know because of the perturbation theory that this uh, eigenstate is unique. And so the, the kind of catch-all here, and the reason why we consider finite volume perturbations is, is number one, everything can be modeled in the same GNS space. And in particular, this also tells us though that the uh, finite volume dynamics of the perturbed system and the, the quasi-adiabatic continuation are also lambda dependent. And what this allows us to do is to number one, identify the the infinite volume limit of the perturbed Hamiltonian's dynamics with uh, the, G the perturbed Hamiltonian in the GNS representation. But moreover, it'll allow us to get convergence of the generator of the dynamics for the spectral flow or for the quasi adiabatic continuation. And in general, if you did not allow your perturbation lambda to be fixed to some finite volume, you would not get the sort of convergence. And what this convergence gives you is that the infinite volume spectral flow is going to be inner. So you can actually represent it on the C-star algebra in terms of a unitary evolution. And then what you can do then is, of course, map this, this unitary evolution to uh, in the genus representation by a unitary. And so this ability to map between the genus representation and the C-star algebra is this kind of key. But just it's going to see I'm running out of time a bit. So let me just kind of give you the broad strokes idea of what happens now. Um, next slide. Uh, the idea is that we now have this perturbed Hamiltonian and we have this unitary that implements this infinite volume spectral flow. And so what we would like to make sense of is this formal equation, which is essentially the same kind of decomposition that we had in the finite volume setting. So we want to take our perturbed Hamiltonian, unitarily evolve it with this infinite volume spectral flow, and then be able to decompose it into three parts, where the first part here is the original unperturbed GNS Hamiltonian. The second bit is our, our new perturbation. And then the third bit is the ground state energy. And we want to make sense of this equation on some dense domain of the GNS Hilbert space. And so the, the first thing we do to kind of make sense of this is we actually show that um, if you take uh, the local algebra acting on this uh, cyclic vector and then multiply it by this GNS unitary, that this the set is actually contained in the domain of the original GNS Hamiltonian. This allows us to make sense of this operator here since the GNS Hamiltonian and the perturbed system have the same domain and we know that this uh, without the unitary, that this subspace is actually dense in the, the domain of the Hamiltonian. Now, the second thing we need is, is kind of an equivalent form of this, this form bound recipe that we had in finite volume systems. And we can prove a similar result in the situation that this perturbation that we have here, when you expand it in terms of the balls uh, of, the, of the lattice, 
actually produces an absolutely summable uh, decomposition in norm. So if I can take the norm here and, and it's absolutely summable. So in particular, what that means is that the perturbation V for which we apply this result has to be bounded. So part of what we need to prove is that this, this, uh, this new perturbation is bounded and how we go about, and that it, in particular, it can also be decomposed in a form that this new form bound recipe can apply. And how we, we go about this is actually via this relation here, which not only says that these vectors are in the domain, but if you pick your favorite vector from this set, you can actually approximate its action on the genus Hamiltonian by actually looking at its action on a finite volume subsystem. This allows you to, to then rewrite uh, the difference of these two terms in terms of finite volume Hamiltonians, in which case you can do the same kind of decomposition that we, we did in the uniform volume stability result in this new GNS setting. And then once you can do that, you, you get the exact same type of result for this perturbed Hamiltonian. Okay, so um, that's that's the, the GNS result. So just like a couple of, of comments. Uh, so first of all, you can also show that um, because of this, this, this result is uniform in the perturbation region uh, lambda, you can also show um, that the bulk stability result extends to the GNS Hamiltonian uh, associated with the state here where alpha S is the, the spectral, or the quasi adiabatic continuation you get from letting lambda tend to ZD. Uh, you can also, the, the quantum spin setting is not necessarily strictly needed. You can also do things, uh, the same kind of result for a lattice fermion model. And in particular, the same strategies uh, would also apply to models with discrete symmetry breaking given a modified uh, LTQO condition and perturbations that also respect the symmetry. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments, Amanda? There is a question in the chat. Ah. Uh, yeah, okay. So it says, is pressure and freeness stable under small perturbations of the interaction? No, it's not. That's actually one of the main points. Thank you for asking. I meant to say that earlier. Um, so it is not stable. So you cannot use this, this um, result that I had at the very beginning that says that if you have a gap and you're frustration free, then your GNS Hamiltonian is also gapped. So that, that won't apply here because perturbed uh, versions will no longer be frustration-free. Chris. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a, kind of a technical question though. Um, yes. So you talked about um, in the finite volume case when you know you potentially have degeneracy and this degeneracy will split as you make this uh, perturbation. So you know there'll be, a, I guess, a width associated with this kind mm -hmm. of breaking down of the ground state space. Um, I, I saw that you had like the average kind of appearing there, but do you actually need to control sort of the width of this splitting or does it not matter? So um, it depends on what you want, to be honest. Okay. Uh, so if you, if you change, if you don't need to, con to uh, control the width, I don't think that the state you would get in the GNS setting would necessarily be, I, I would not be sure if it's a ground state anymore because you, you have this width. So I'm not exactly sure what would happen there. However, um, and this is kind of the point I was, I, I was trying to make it, I was kind of going a bit fast. Um, if you do allow, what you can actually do for this form bound uh, is you can actually prove a form bound where this epsilon here depends uh, on the volume and it tends to zero in the thermodynamic limit. And this controls the splitting. So this, this is actually related to uh, the diameter of the splitting. And so in the thermodynamic limit, if the splitting goes to zero, you converge back to a ground state. And so this is why this, this GNS state that we'll construct is actually a ground state in the end. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
Emil has his hand up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Important to assume that the degeneracy is finite. Uh, yes. Well, so that that will for this uniform gap result that's guaranteed because it's a finite volume Hamiltonian and that works on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, but there is no constraint on the degeneracy growing. However, I would I would be shocked if you could prove with a growing degeneracy that LTQO holds. So the more vectors you have in the ground state space, the harder it is to prove LTQO, I think. Uh, one, one. Well, actually, sorry, I, sh I, should, I should take that back. So there are things like AKLT models on, on the two-dimensional lattice where you have this, um, you expect that the bulk of the, the ground states all look the same, but it only differs at the boundary. So in those kinds of situations, you, you should expect LTQL. But um, if you are allowing for a lot of different things to happen on the interior of your ground states, uh, then I would think it's quite difficult to prove LTQL. And uh, my, my, oh, yeah. uh, my other question, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> in, the, in the cases where, uh, for example, we have one uh, another observable which is one uh, which is invariant under the evolution, like magnet magnetization, or which splits the the, the Hilbert space in, uh, in 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 many subspaces. Uh, are those covered by, by, by your analysis in, in the sense that these assumptions on gaps can, can hold in such situations? For um, example, we have a spin yes. chain organization up and we have just uh, two spins up. And sure. we know in so, that the spectrum should be just uh, continue. Uh, it should just be continuous in the thermodynamic limit. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So we should uh, in that in that sector in that sector with just two speeds up, then this thing can uh, can move anywhere on the on the lattice. So uh, I will expect the the spectrum to be uh, unless unless they are they are no even if they are bound states then. Uh, the spectrum should be. Oh, you won't have LTQO. <laughs> that's that's right. So uh, that's, uh, that's exactly I'm I'm asking. Is is this kind of case is covered by by your analysis? No, because we have to have this LTQO for for the stability, right? So that's that's one of the the key assumptions, I, I would say. So then, when you when you go into fermionic. Uh, models where the number of particles, for example, is conserved, you have the same, uh, the same, the same situation in some sense. Uh, so, opinion. right. I mean, so this, the stability result doesn't cover all possible cases in which uh, you have a spectral gap per se. Um, so this, this LTQO is, is required though for, for you to prove the result. I, would, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, yes, I should pay attention. Well, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but you didn't, you didn't discuss the, the cases where you have broken symmetries and right. then you have to modify the LTQO condition. You can still prove something. Yes. Yeah, so in the, in the discrete symmetry breaking case, you will definitely have in the thermodynamic limit multiple ground states that are weak star limits. And so this LTQO condition wouldn't make sense for that type of system because it, it guarantees a unique infinite volume ground state. So you have to actually introduce a modified LTQO where it essentially identifies a sector of ground states and it proves LTQO for this ground state sector. So you have, say, two ground states in the thermodynamic limit. In the finite volume ground state space, you can kind of identify subspaces where the, the these these states will kind of converge to one state or the other, and you want to prove LTQO in the individual sectors. And then you also have to consider the situation of, of, the, of uh, how an observable behaves in the inner product between states between two sectors. 
and you essentially assume that that goes to zero. Um, but so you can do this kind of in, in a, you can modify this condition in a way that you can hold for more general settings as well. Um, but for the, the method as stated, you would need LTQ. Thank you. We see that Peter and Herman both have their hands up. So maybe Peter, I saw his first. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who was first, but uh, I'm happy to go first, yeah. So <laughs> I was wondering, could you uh, maybe say a little bit what happens? So what's the difference um, if you drop this periodic boundary condition? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I, I kind of pulled a fast one on you there. Uh, so the, the motivation, so essentially what you have to do is you have to, uh, depending on your, your model, you might have to kind of fudge uh, the support of the perturbation a bit. So I think the, the kind of classical example of, of where this kind of holds is the AKLT model, where you have uh, a one-dimensional chain and uh, along this chain, the interior of the ground states all looks the same. So it's essentially, it, it's, a, it's a BBS representation, but it essentially looks like a, a tensor product of the same state. And you can only have a difference of, of the ground states along the boundary. So the, the boundary kind of behaves like a, a, a free spin parameter. And so you have choices of spin up and spin down along the, per, the boundary. Um, now, of course, there is a local operator that can distinguish between spin up and spin down at the boundary. This is very easy to construct. So, so what you have to do, though, is, is modify this perturbation region to essentially be some interior region uh, in which the, the ground states can't be distinguished, um, but that this interior region also grows with the, the sequence of volumes lambda n. So you actually kind of introduce what I call perturbation region and it's on the interior. So even though you're not perturbing everywhere in the thermodynamic limit, it, it will give you the same model as if you had perturbed everywhere. I see, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Herman? Hi. Okay, hi. hi. Herman. Um, so, my question um, is something that I already asked some of the people in the audience, but maybe there's now more that can uh, give an answer, which I would like to know. So you look at perturbation theory for a perturbation V, which is somehow um, like the Hamiltonian. So uh, in particular, it's not local. Suppose you take a situation where this V is uh, local in space. Um, can one say something about and you are in a situation where the system is gapped, so you have a finite, uh, degenerate uh, um, uh, ground state, and uh, well above there's the the rest of the spectrum, which is typically essential spectrum, I think. So there's lots of eigenvalues lying there. Can one say something about uh, the stability of this essential gap in the spectrum um, of the GNS Hamiltonian under local perturbation? So a little um, bit like in, in Weyl's theorem, Weyl's essential spectral theorem. But then you, you washed out the ground state, isn't it? Well, the, the ground state will might move, okay? It might move inside of the essential spectrum in the whole thing. What can also happen is that from the essential spectrum, some eigenvalues move out uh, yeah. towards the but, but the ground state and there would be some level crossings and so in the low lying spectrum of this many body operator. So this is the, the situation ground, I would like to, to the study. Ground, the, I would like to know whether there's any kind of a stability result on essential, on a gap in the essential spectrum under local perturbation. But the ground state, the ground energy is not in the essential spectrum. So you wash that one away and the essential spectrum, then it's connected. Yes. So there is no stability of the gap because there is no gap in the essentials. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, okay, there, then the, the question should so be- So are you trying to ask whether or not the essential spectrum stays essential spectrum? Is that kind of the idea? Right, it, it stays the same. And this, that as you move a local perturbation, you turn it on that there's only a finite number of 
states moving outside of the essential spectrum. Oh, okay, so it's a little bit like in your pictures that uh, you you had the the ground states split up. Okay, you would also have mm -hmm. some eigenvalues move down. Now, in your situation where the V is really huge, okay, it's like a, a homogeneous perturbation. Of course, you can move everything. Yeah, right. I mean, the whole essential so, can also move. So you're essentially asking about something like this, where this this genus homogeneous. But the V, yes, and same thing here. The V is is is, is fixed to some finite volume lambda. Now I I of course have a uniform result, um, but the, ah, the so particular Hamiltonian okay. is Sorry, local. I, uh, okay, so your V is local actually. Yes. So I don't know if I can say anything about uh, essential spectrum. I haven't thought about that myself. But what I can say um, is that if you one other thing I can point out is that uh, okay. this okay. other result that we, we I showed earlier about the persistence of gaps in the presence of form bound, notice that this, this assumption of the gap is not a ground state gap, is any gap in the spectrum. So, so once you get this form bound result, it'll actually tell you something about higher order gaps as well. So it not only gives you a uh, persistence of ground state gaps, but you can also say something about higher order gaps in the, the model as well. Okay. So, so now what my question, okay, I understand. So, but now I'm a bit confused. I, I would have expected that you can prove stability of the gap also without the assumption that uh, V is local. So I missed that point in the talk actually. So you can. So um, here, the, the result that I prove is um, that for these local Vs, that the, the gap remains open uh, along some parameter range that is uniform in the choice of perturbation region, right? So it's kind of similar to this uniform gap result that we had before. So I, I prove stability for every lambda. And then once you have that, you can actually, um, there. Uh, once you have that, then you get that it'll also give you gap stability in the thermodynamic limit. That's what this alpha, this alpha S is here. It's the thermo, it's the infinite volume spectral flow. It also will induce a ground state, and this this ground state's genus Hamiltonian will also be gapped. So you can lift this finite volume perturbation stability to the, the infinite system as well. Very good. It is uh, three minutes past one here in the oh. um, US. And Emil, you had some comment? No, it was just uh... <laughs> <laughs> just remarking on the time. So I have a final uh, pleasurable duty, which is to thank Amanda uh, one more time. So thank you very much.